A year after his trial, interest in mob boss James Whitey Bulger is again ramping up. A Hollywood feature starring Johnny Depp as Bulger has been shooting in and around Boston. The two-bed, two-bath apartment that served as his Santa Monica hideaway is now for rent. And tomorrow, a documentary about the cold-blooded killer's trial and relationship with the FBI hits theaters. WGBH News Arts Editor Jared Bowen, who covered the Bulger saga with me for years, is here with his take on it. Thanks, Jared. So, I mean, does this cover the whole span of his crimes for you over decades and decades, or is it narrowly focused, the documentary? It really uses the trial as a springboard, and, and partly that's why I admire this film so much, because the trial was only last year, less than a year ago, and already they've been able to encapsulate so much of, of what came out of that trial and Whitey Bulger's history, but it really does focus on his relationship with the government and, and whether or not he was an informant and exploring the government's culpability in this case. We have a little bit clip of the trailer where you see just the sort of the arc of the story. Here. The very office that is currently prosecuting Whitey Bulger had some kind of corrupt relationship with Whitey Bulger. The federal government is so desperate to try to convince people that he's an informant. Where's the Boston police? Where's the FBI? He realized I get a blank check. I can do anything I want. Hmm. So do you, you hear Bulger? I heard you talk about that in, in, in this morning on the radio. What, what is he talking about? This is what's really, really fascinating, for, especially for people who, who know this story mm -hmm. and have never heard his say, and for people who are disappointed that he never took the stand. Here you see him on the phone with his attorney, and you hear this conversation. So you, you basically you have Whitey Bulger giving his defense in cooperating with this film, and we have a, a sense here of him addressing the issue of whether or not he was a rat, mm -hmm. as became the focus ah, yeah. of this trial. You've told me since the very first day I met you that you've never been an informant. That's correct. Does that mean you've never been an informant in your entire life? Never. As a teenager, I took many a beating at the police stations, and I never cracked. As a bank robber, I was captured. I pled guilty to free the girlfriend that I was with, and I got a 20-year prison sentence, first offender. In the Boston FBI, no way. I met John Connolly, who's a salty guy, Irish Catholic like myself. You know, it's friendship. Jeez, if I ever hear anything, I'll tip you off, uh, give you a heads up. And then I tell, all right, John, and I says, I'll see you. You can let me know, I'd appreciate it. And, and that's how it got started. Well, that's fascinating. He sounds like um, he sounds very lucid and like a, he sounds like a younger man too. Well, it's something that really, really grounds you because there is so much that comes out of this story with yeah. the Whitey Bulger myth, and he's this larger than life figure. To actually hear him talk and to understand these elements of this story makes it very, very mm -hmm. fascinating. There's also, also, I have to say, this little interlude, probably about 14 or 15 minutes, where they. Uh, digest whether or not he was even an informant, which is a, de a departure that many people in the area, especially families, found really sensational. But it does create for great nuance and narrative arc here. Mm -hmm. All right, Jared Bowen, thanks for that. I'm going to bring another guest into the discussion here. He's made a few cameos also in the Whitey documentary. Hank Brennan was part of Bulger's defense team. Welcome back to Greater Boston, Hank. Well, thanks for having me. So I take it you've seen the film as well? I have. And what is your take? Do you think it's a, a realistic portrayal of the trial, or is it a little thin on detail for your liking? Well, unfortunately, the camera wasn't allowed in the courtroom, yeah. so it can't capture the Believe moments me, very and the emotion. <laughs> I think we all are, and we spoke yeah. about that yeah. before, but I think it really was a bold move by Joe Berlinger, and what he did is he had the courage to look at the entire case objectively, to try to unwind some of the mist that had been told over the decades, and I think for that reason, this film's really important. It begins to show there's a lot more to the story. This is just scratching the surface, and as we tried to show at trial, the complicity isn't just the Boston FBI. This is systemic, and at some point, there has to be accountability. I know you've been asked this before, and I think I even asked you, then why didn't you put him on the stand? Why didn't we hear some of the stuff? It, it, he was going to be convicted no matter what on something or other. They were going to bring him down. But let's hear what his defense was. We were desperate to put him on the stand, and he was willing to take the stand and implicate himself. In fact, Jay Carney and I, in our questioning, implicated him many times through the trial. But the important thing is that there had to be equal accountability. We wanted to call representatives, not just from the FBI, 
the Department of Justice who allowed this to happen and orchestrated it. We wanted him to be able to talk about his relationships with high-level players in the Department of Justice and the rulings by the court after the government tried to prevent that was he could not call witnesses from the Department of Justice. He could not speak about those relationships. He could not discuss the protection he had. So inevitably, he could take the stand and simply give a confession, which he was willing to do, but it had no accountability for the Department of Justice. We wanted a fair trial where everybody could be held accountable. Yeah, but I mean, right in the beginning of the trial, a judge ruled that there was no merit to that defense. So, I mean, once that ruling had been made, you still had the opportunity. Well, we actually didn't. The judge didn't decide the facts and say there was no merit. What the court said is, you can't present it at trial. If you want a pretrial hearing, you can have the issue aired before me. And Mr. Bulger, under the circumstances, did not trust a court to make judgments on his defense. He wanted a jury of his mm -hmm. peers. So he wasn't allowed to talk about any of those issues. He wasn't allowed to call the witnesses. So that defense was taken from us. And that's why he didn't testify. We were hopeful that they would have the trial in Oklahoma or Florida, where it is televised. He'd be allowed to testify. And then the community and the public could judge his credibility. I'm surprised he was allowed to participate, even by phone in this documentary because, as you know, 60 Minutes and a number of other news organizations wanted to get an interview with Bolger in prison. Why does this, I mean, this is still being filmed and his voice is there. Why was that allowed? This was a post-trial conversation that Attorney Carney had with Jim Bulger. There was a ruling before trial that the government felt any conversation by him with the media would prejudice the case. Ignoring the fact that every one of their witnesses had had their opportunity on national syndicate uh, shows. So in this period before he was sentenced, but after the trial, there wasn't that inherent prejudice, and this phone call happened at some point. So it was just one phone call? As yeah. far as I know, it was one phone call, yes. So you are right now in the middle, thick of the appeal on uh, Whitey Bulger. You said, you told me it's, it's due August 4th. You're going out there to meet with uh, White, Whitey. What we, what we, what will you be talking about? What will, what will the essence of that be? Well, when I see him, we'll talk about a little bit of the trial. We'll catch up. Uh, but we'll also, most importantly, talk about the issues that we're going to present to the appeals court. I think that the uh, brief is strong. The issues I feel passionately about, it really is about the Department of Justice being equally accountable for their conduct. There's two wonderful lawyers. Uh, Danya Fulton, who worked on the trial team, is working with me. And a gifted lawyer, Jim Bedreau, has been helping uh, with the appeal, and he's been instrumental. So I want to go discuss the appeal with him. Uh, let him know we're proceeding and talk about the issues. He was in uh, solitary confinement while he was at Plymouth. Is he in the general population in Arizona? He is in Arizona as a uh, convicted prisoner. He's in a regular population unit with the other prisoners. The conditions in Plymouth were unique, to say the least. Solitary confinement for two and a half years was an extraordinary situation. You know, just briefly, we, we, this is a documentary, but we mentioned that Johnny Depp film. How do you feel about that? It's a Hollywood production. You know, I take great offense. Uh, it pains me when I see articles in the newspaper glorifying what happened in the 70s and 80s. It's based on a story that is really fiction, a story that predated all the civil trials, the Conley trials, this trial. So it just exasperates the fraud that has been imparted by the Department of Justice. This book was a mouthpiece for the FBI and DOJ. And now we have Hollywood. Black Mass, you're talking about. Black Mass. They're glorifying and pillaging off the suffering. We still have victims and yeah. families. Are they going to get it? And we brought that up. Are they going to divide any of the spoils with the victims, or is it strictly a Hollywood? I think you would have to ask them, but I would anticipate they wouldn't give a dime. And what they're interested in is just their bottom yeah. line sales. They're going to fictionalize and sensationalize the story and not care about the suffering of everybody. And really, mm -hmm. if you've seen firsthand, and I'm sure you have, you've spoken to many, the pain that yes. these families have yeah. had. This is really a travesty, and I in no way validate that movie. I happen to agree with you. All right, Hank Brennan, thanks so much for coming.